welcome back for another fun-filled episode of Doc Talks News and Views. This is our live repairing podcast, and my name is Deborah, and I'm here with... Yeah, uh, I'm Katrina. <laughs> and today we are speaking with a local bee expert. Can we call you an expert? We're speaking with sure. Kathy DeGraw. And I don't actually remember all of your credentials, Kathy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the, Kathy is going to be here with us today. We're going to talk about bees and beekeeping. And I think maybe we'll start with you giving us a little bit of an intro of how you became interested in bees. Sure. Um, well, my name is Kathy DeGraff. I've been living in Northborough since 1994. And I took up beekeeping in 2006. Um, I have always been interested in gardening, and I've always been interested in bugs. And one day it occurred to me that it would be really fun to have bees so that I could see my bees on my flowers. Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. And I think um, you and I first met a few years back um, through you did a program here at the library, a presentation. And I never realized how many beekeepers there are here in Northbrook. So, like, how did all that get started, and, and why are there so many beekeepers here? I think there's just a lot of people who are interested in the environment now. There's a lot of people who want to try to do what they can to help the environment, and um, people think that beekeeping is just a very cool thing to do in your backyard, and it's pretty easy to do in your backyard. There's a lot of people keeping chickens, too, as mm -hmm. well. It's kind of the same trend. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's fabulous. My neighbors um, keep chickens, and down the road, um, I have the Olbergs um, live near me, so I benefit from their honey, and I just oh, always yes. think it's wonderful yes. to see their bees in my yard. Yeah. Um, so when you are sort of a backyard beekeeper, how does this all start? Where do you get your hives? Where do you get your bees? Like, if someone wanted to do this, how would they get started? What would be your some recommendations? My first recommendation would be to go to bee school which is not business school, it's beekeeping school. Beekeeping. And the Worcester County Beekeepers um, has a beekeeping school that's taught every year in the spring. It starts in March, usually on the first Thursday of March, and it goes for eight weeks. And it's some pretty intensive classes on how to do beekeeping. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of ways that it can that it can go bad, not, you know, not terrible things, but your bees might not make it if you don't know what you're doing. So I always advise people to get some education about it. And um, usually people will order their bees while they're in bee school and the bees come around April and May. Some of them come a little earlier and then people will set up their hives that year. So you're kind of learning as you're doing, but you get, you get a little bit of a head start in March and with the classes. So. That's fabulous. I guess we should have had you come in March. <laughs> but for all of you listeners out there, just put that on your calendar for next year to check out the Worcester County... Worcester County Beekeeping Association. And it's there are meetings monthly every, every month outdoors in the warm weather and every month indoors in the cold weather. So if anybody's interested and they're getting started just now, you can still join the Beekeepers Association and you can go to the meetings and you'll learn a lot just by watching people and doing... It's never really too late to learn hand to hand. If you can find someone to teach you one by one on one, that's that's a, another great way to learn as well. So sort of shadow somebody through yeah. the season. Well, that yeah. sounds terrific. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you order your bees? <laughs> <laughs> that's always an interesting question because they don't just sort of fly into your yard and move into the hive. <laughs> First, you have to get your equipment. It has to you have to have a home for them before they arrive, and the equipment is is your hive, and you probably want to smoke and a bee veil and maybe a beekeeping suit and a couple of little metal tools that go with it. And then you order your bees from someone who deals in bees. And there are two ways that you can get them. One is in a package, which is basically a cage full of bees shipped up from the south, from the southern states, where they raise them earlier in the year because the weather is a little warmer there. Um, and the other way is with a miniature hive that you can buy. Usually those are sold more locally. They might be made as a split out of somebody else's hive. Mm -hmm. They'll come along in May because the bees sleep most of the winter, and they, when they are ready to fly, it takes them a little while to build up their strength, and then the beekeepers will start to, when they get enough bees in the hive, they'll split part of the bees out and make a new hive. So that's called a nuke or a nucleus hive. Oh. So there's packages and nukes. And the third way you can get them is if you catch a swarm, which is 
probably something I could talk about for another hour just on its own, <laughs> swarm catching. Whoa, that yeah. sounds scary. Tell yeah. me about swarm catching. So swarms happen when a beehive gets a little overcrowded. When the bees are really successful, you have too many babies in there, and the bees say, hey, we need more space. There's not enough room in this hive for everybody. So this is their way of multiplying. They'll actually make new queens getting ready for the old queen to leave. When the day comes, it's usually a beautiful sunny day, and the old queen will fly out of the hive with a whole bunch of the bees that were in the hive, and they'll hang out on a branch, usually not too far from their old hive. Then they'll send scouts out to look for a new home. The scouts will come back with all their reports. They do this little bee dance. You know that bees dance to communicate yes. with each other. They have a little dance that says, I found a space and the space is right. This is how big it is and this is how far away and how high up. People have actually decoded these dances now. And once they've made a collective decision about which space is the best that all the scouts have, have found, then the, the swarm will fly off following the scouts to the new home and they'll move in. Whoa. So if you can catch them while they're hanging around, they're usually on that branch for a couple of hours, sometimes a little longer, depends on the weather. When beekeepers see a swarm, we get so excited because this is free bees. So <laughs> all you got to do is collect them and put them into a hive. And uh, that collecting, the easiest way to do it is if they're on a branch, you cut the branch and you take the whole group of them you know, it might be 5,000 bees hanging off of that branch, and you gently, gently, gently put them into a box and take them home. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at the look on your face. <laughs> I would be terrified. <laughs> they look pretty scary, but they're actually very gentle because when they're not inside their hive, they're not defending their home, and honeybees oh. are very, very gentle by nature. Um, except when you try to get into their house and they think you're attacking them. So wow. that's, you know, that's when they get a little upset. Defensive, we call yeah. it. They're not aggressive, they're defensive. defensive. Now, have you ever personally caught a swarm? Absolutely. Oh, my yeah. gosh. It's, how it's, how it's, often do bees swarm? Every spring. It's We're coming into swarm really? season right now. When the flowers start to come out and there's a lot of food, the trees are blooming right now, the bees are collecting nectar, they're making babies like crazy. And they build up their strength of their hives, and then as soon as they're strong enough, then the swarms will come. So every hive will swarm if it's healthy and strong. Wow. And beekeepers spend a lot of time trying to keep them from doing that because you don't want half of your bees to just fly away. Right. Um, so, but if it does happen, then we're very happy to collect a swarm. If it's our swarm, even better. If it's somebody else's swarm, even better. So, <laughs> um, yeah, then you bring it home, and then you then you have a second hive. You know, where you had one hive, now you have two. Wow. Meantime, the old bees stay behind. They've got new queens. Uh, a new queen usually will hatch. Sometimes there's more than one. There might be a battle between the queens to figure out who's going to be the one. And then that, that queen will get herself mated, which is a whole other process. And, and then that colony will go on like they did before and build up again. Wow. That's remarkable. <laughs> so how many different types of bees live in the hive? We, I, I've heard about a scout bee that you've mentioned and the queen bee, and then all the others are workers? Like, how does that? Yeah, so they're, well, they're mostly girls. You know that the queen is a girl, obviously. Um, there are worker bees. There's a queen, one queen bee usually, just one, sometimes two, but usually just one. Um, there are workers, which are all girls, and then there are drones, who are the only boys. There's just a few of them. Um, their only job is to mate with a queen, not the not this queen, but other queens. It's yeah, bee biology probably is a whole other day's topic. <laughs> but, um, uh, the workers have different jobs during their lifetime. They're the same bees. They're they're all the the girl bees. They hatch out of their little out of their little cell. The day that they hatch, they go straight to work. Their first job is to be a nurse bee to feed the baby larvae. Their second job is to do some cleaning, and then when they are older, they do other jobs around the hive. Some of them might be guard bees at the front of the hive. Some of them take care of the queen and feed her and keep her clean. And then at the very end of their life, they become field bees. And the field bees are the ones that go out to the flowers. Those are the ones that you see collecting all the food for the hive and bringing it back. So um, scout bees, is, is pro they're probably an overlap with the field bees. They're the bees that are you know, used to flying off away from the group. They'd be the older ones. Wow. Now, how far away from a hive generally does a bee go to, to gather nectar? 
That's a really good question. So it depends on um, what's in the neighborhood. So usually they like to stay within about a two mile radius of the hive. But uh, if there's a shortage of food or there's a really good spot a little further away, they, they've been known to go up to five miles away from their hive. But usually I'll see my bees in my backyard because I like to plant a lot of flowers for them. They won't go to the flowers that are right next to the hive. And I think the reason for that is that when they come out of the hive, you know, insects poop also. And so when honeybees come out of the hive, they don't poop inside the hive. So they poop outside the hive. So they're not going to visit the flowers that are near the hive because who knows what's on them, you know. So huh. that's my guess. I haven't been able to ask them, but. Um. <laughs> they don't have a bee dance to let them know, phew, it stinks out here. <laughs> <laughs> not that I've seen, but sometimes I want to turn myself into a bee and go inside the hive and talk to them and just ask them, why are you really doing that? I really want to know the answer. So yeah, they'll go to the flowers in my garden, which is a few feet away from my hive, but yeah. So what kind of flowers do you plant that keeps your bees happy? Oh, there's wonderful, you know, one tree will give them so much food. So um, mm. a cherry tree, a crab apple tree. I have, a, I have tulip trees in my yard, if you know what those, those are. are. They have across the street from me. They're beautiful. They trees. have a big flower. When you see them bloom, look inside the flowers and see if you see any pollinators, because I've seen like six bees inside one of those big okay. flowers. They like to climb. It's a really fun thing to see. Um, and then they love herbs, so if, you're, if you don't have room for trees, oh. you can put out a pot of herbs, and you'll probably see all sorts of pollinators like herbs. Sage is one of their favorites, sage and thyme. I don't see them on my lavender quite as much, but, mm. um, yeah, you know, a lot of the annual herbs, they love borage, if you've ever heard of borage. Mm -hmm. um, Echinacea, coneflower, yes. is a pollinator favorite for bees. The flowers that honeybees can visit tend to be a little more shallow, if you watch bumblebees, they can they can they have a longer tongue, so they can dig that tongue into a deeper flower. So they'll visit like bumblebees will pollinate tomatoes, but honeybees cannot because that flower is just a little too deep for a honeybee's tongue. Hmm. So I see um, honeybees all over the um, the echinacea in my yeah. yard. I think that's why they come for it. They so like echinacea for pollen and nectar both. Some flowers have mostly pollen, some flowers have mostly nectar, and some have both. Echinacea is one of those. It's like a magic plant. Yes. Wow. And then you'll see butterflies on them too. That's wonderful. The butterflies are on my joe pie weed. Oh so yeah, really joe pie that. weed is, yeah. I've seen them, I, I haven't, I've planted joe pie weed, but my honeybees don't really visit it. I think those mm -hmm. flowers might be a little too deep or something. But keep your eyes open, because you never know. There's no rule. They'll visit what they want to visit. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, uh, goldenrod in the fall when the goldenrod is out. And that horrible, nasty weed, um, uh, the Japanese knotweed mm -hmm. that everybody hates when it yes. takes over their yard, that is a wonderful nectar plant. <laughs> and the honeybees <laughs> just love it. So it's got some redeeming features. <laughs> so when it takes over, just let it. <laughs> if well, you, love you know, bees, use your fine. judgment. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's not a climber, the one I'm thinking of. But yeah, the climbing one, that's not a, that's a, a bittersweet. Bittersweet, yeah. yeah bittersweet is not, yeah, feel free to cut that one. <laughs> the honeybees don't care about that one. So the knotweed is which one? It's, a, it's like a bamboo. It grows by runner roots, and it comes oh. up. Maybe. There's a whole patch of it by the Assabet River. Yes. And um, John Lawrence, who runs Pepper's Catering, mm -hmm. was keeping bees for a while. I don't know if he still is, but his place is right down by the Assabet. And he got this wonderful honey one fall, and he was trying to figure out what kind of honey it was. And it was this beautiful, dark amber honey. And I said, oh, that's not weed honey. That's, it's some of the best tasting honey. Wow. So, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Wow. Um, does it take a lot of time for, for raising bees? Is there a lot of work involved? Or? During swarm season, it, you, you have to put in some time every week to open up your hives and look inside and see what's going on. Um, this is probably the busiest time of year for beekeepers, but it's really like a once a week thing. I mean, and in between you can just watch them and enjoy them, but um, once a week you have to kind of open up your hives and inspect them. That's what we call it. Ins inspecting, you take out the frames and you look to see how many babies they're making and, you know, do they have any diseases and how, how is their food supply? If, you know, if we have a dry spring and we don't get enough rain, the flowers don't bloom, then you got to feed your bees. So, you know, you kind of have to look after them. But it's, it's less work than cats or dogs. It's not oh, wow. like, and if you want to go on vacation, you know, you don't have to 
find somebody to take care of your bees. They're just as happy if you leave them alone. They don't really want to be taken care of. Well, that was my, my follow-up question is, does it bother them if you're taking out the... Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, you, it depends things. on how you do it. So um, if we're opening up the hives, we, I teach people to be as gentle as they can. Don't squish any bees because when you accidentally kill one, they give off a pheromone and the other bees can smell it and they know that something's going on. The hive might be under attack. So mm-hmm. we try to move slowly because they can't see you move as well if you're moving slowly. And so you have to learn to be very calm because you've got all these stinging insects and you're, you know, you got your hands all over them, but you're, you know, you're moving slowly and calmly and not panicking. So it takes a little practice. It's a little nerve wracking at first and then you get used to it. But if you do all that, then you can move in among them and you can manipulate them and they won't mind really very much. They'll just go about their business. And I've even had hives where I open it up, I pull out a frame and the the queen is there laying eggs in front of me. She's just going on with what she was doing, and you know she's not minding that I pulled her out into the sunshine and took a look at her. You know, it's a it's amazing what they'll put up with, to be honest. <laughs> that is, um, so that they're is very so cool. gentle creatures. They <laughs> are. They've been bred to be gentle. I think that they weren't always so. The first honeybees came to the United States with the pilgrims on the boats there. Okay. And they were a, a breed of bee that wasn't as friendly. They were mm-hmm. what, uh, what's known as black bees, because back in those days, that's what they had. Um, and you know, you had, to, you had to be a little braver, probably, <laughs> to take care of them, because they were more defensive. They would be a little touchier when you go into their hives. Um, these days, we get our bees from the southern states, usually, but the Bees that they're breeding are mostly known as, they're mostly Italians. There's different breeds of bees, but the ones that we, that most people I know keep are called Italians. They're golden in color, and they've been bred to be very gentle and not to mind if you're taking their hive apart. They'll put up with a lot. Mm. Every now and then you'll hear about Africanized bees, Mm. which are AKA killer bees, which aren't really a thing in New England because they, they prefer the warmer climates, but they, in, in southern states, it's more of a problem because they, they can survive there. Um, but every now and then, we'll have a hive that's sort of got a few Africanized genes in it, and they'll be a lot less friendly. And that's not a good thing if you're keeping bees in the suburbs because, you know, even if you don't mind having those bees in your yard, your neighbor might not be too thrilled about it. So we don't usually put up with that. If you get a hive that's really, really overly defensive like that, it's, you know, it can be a danger if people are you know, in the neighborhood or allergic, especially if people are allergic. Um, so we'll, we'll usually take care of that hive by killing the queen and putting in a queen who's going to lay eggs that are going to be gentle bees. Wow. Yeah. So you have to know how to go into the hive and find right. the queen. Find the queen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how do you identify the queen? She's bigger than the others. Okay. Yeah, not much bigger, a little bit bigger. She has kind of the same sort of a front end as the, as the worker bees, but she's a really long abdomen because she's got inside that abdomen, she's got all of the eggs that she will ever need for her whole life. And so one by one, she's laying them. And um, when she's a little older, she runs out of eggs, kind of like chickens do. And then it's time for a new queen. Sometimes the bees will take care of that. Sometimes the beekeeper will have to take care of it. Wow. But so you, queens are made in each hive, then, right? When yeah. Each hive, each hive has the ability to make new queens out of any egg, any worker egg. Any worker could be a queen, but they have to be. They, they have to make the decision when the when the bee has just barely hatched into a little tiny larva, a one to three day old larva. It depends on what they feed them. So if they want to make a new queen, they'll pick the larvae that they're going to feed special food, and that's royal jelly is what they get. A queen gets royal jelly her whole life. A worker will get just a little bit at the beginning of her life. But a queen gets a whole lot more, and then they go through this metamorphosis that changes them, changes their hormones, I guess, into a, into a, a queen bee. Wow. And usually the bees will raise, when they want to make a new queen, they'll make more than one just in case it fails because, you know, it's biology, so sometimes, sometimes you need a backup. So when we open up the hive and we see the special cell the, that, a bee, that a queen bee would be raised in, then we know that they're making queens. They're thinking about swarming, and so that's the sign that beekeepers look for. It's one of the things you look for when you're inspecting the hive. I am just absolutely fascinated by this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a complete bee novice, so everything you've said, I'm, 
our viewer, our, our listeners can't see, but my jaw is just on the floor <laughs> the whole time. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really great hobby. It is a commitment, and you know, you have to. It's you're taking on a responsibility if you want to get bees because they're living creatures, and you want to do right by them, and you want to help them thrive. And there's a lot of different things that they need over time. Um, but you know, it's not like it's not like they're going to really take all of your time, but it's a lot of fun. And it's once you get the hang of it, it's very meditative. It's, it's not like you're going to be out there on your cell phone when you got the hive open, you're going right. to be focused entirely on what you're doing. So, wow. That's so cool. I like how you had explained Kathy about how you have to move so slowly among the bees so that you don't startle them or trigger their, their pheromones, their pheromones to attack. But at the same time, Probably for novices, you're like, oh my god, I have all these bees, I've got to get through this, I don't want to get stung. It's kind of like, I can see what you mean by saying it would take a lot of practice to be calm when there's bees all around you. Have you been stung a lot? I've been stung, you know, some. I, I don't know about a lot. I, okay. I usually get stung every year. Um, Usually because I squished somebody that I, you know, and I didn't mean to. And, you know, sometimes they're just in a bad mood and they'll, you know, they'll be a little more defensive on a particular day. And so, you know, um, usually I will work without gloves on so that I can feel the bees under my hands. And, right. you know, then when I feel somebody that's in the wrong place, I can move my fingers so that I'm, you know, taking care of them and, and not, not squishing them. But, mm. yeah, I, I do get stung. I've had, when I was beginning, I had one or two bad days when things didn't go well and, you know, the bees ended up chasing me away from the hive. Oh, no. <laughs> And they always, once one of them stings you, the others know they can smell it. So right. they do a lot by smell. They actually have a stronger sense of smell than a, than a dog. Um, and oh. so they can smell the sting, and then the others will come and sting you in the same place. <laughs> not always, not always. But, you know, if, it go, if you have a bad day, then, you know, you get one or two sting, uh, uh, more than one sting, then, you know, the others can find you, and then it's just time to, like, close up the hive and, <laughs> right, and, and well, come and back they, another day. And bees usually don't survive a sting either. That is entirely true, yeah. The workers die when they sting you. They have a barbed stinger, and um, it tears their body apart when they pull out, so they, they can't live for very long after that. That's the other reason I don't like to get stung, yeah. because, you know, those are my bees. I don't want them to die. Right, mm. right. So bees um, obviously play a, a very important part in our food chain web in our ecosystem. How do honeybees, like the bees that we would keep in our backyard, how do they relate to our like regular environment, the health of our environment versus the native bees? And like what's the difference between them? Well, somehow North America survived without honeybees for, you know, millennia. Um, before people brought them here in the 1600s. So there was pollination before honeybees came along, but honeybees are extremely good pollinators, which is why a lot of people breed them just for pollination. The honey's not necessarily the point if you're a commercial beekeeper. The pollination is the, is the thing. Um, but native bees are, can be good pollinators um, as well. And um, I know that people use, they're talking about using mason bees commercially. Um, but the biggest difference, difference between our honeybees and most of the native bees is that our honeybees are social insects. They live in a colony with the queen and multiple workers and drones, um, where a lot of our native bees are single, sing, um, what's the mm. word? Solitary. 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 Okay. So you may have seen, um, there's, a, there's a spot over near Wyman Gordon over here near where I live where there's a, a bank, a sandy bank with little holes in it. And there are, there's a whole batch of native bees that have made their nests in the ground in those little holes. They all happen to be in the same place, but they're not working together. Each one of them has laid her own eggs and is raising her own young in there. And when the young hatch, they come out of those holes and they go off and do their solitary thing. They're not working together at all. Uh, and their cycle, their biology is a little different over the winter as well, I think. They, uh, a lot of the solitary bees don't make it but there are, they leave their babies in the ground, and then the babies will just hatch in the spring. And the honeybees actually survive the whole winter. They're actually inside the hive, still awake, moving, eating food. They slow down, but they're not, you know, they're not dead. The colony wakes up, 
in about January and starts making babies. So their cycle is, is different than the solitary bees. That's the biggest difference. Bumblebees, by the way, are a social insect as well. But in, in a bumblebee colony, there might be maybe 500 when they're at their strongest. A honeybee colony can have 50,000 in there. So the scale is com completely different. Wow. Yeah. And they're tiny, the honeybees. The honeybees are much smaller, obviously, yes. yeah. Yeah. You might see the bumblebees right now cruising along the ground yeah, looking yeah. for, those are queen bees, they're looking for a hole to make a new colony. For bumblebees, they're, most of them don't overwinter, but the queens do. They bury under the leaf litter. They're born in the fall, and they pass the winter, you know, buried under the leaves or someplace warm, and then they wake up in the spring and they look for a place to start their own colony. They start laying their eggs and raising their own young all on their own. The, the mother, the queen bumblebee is the, her own worker until she raises her first batch of workers. Wow. And then they go to work and take that over. Yeah. Yeah, insects are, are so interesting. When I was a little kid, I was terrified of insects, and, and I had to get over that. And now I, I just, now I understand why people are so fascinated by them. Mm. That's interesting um, to have a fear and then work with it, and mm -hmm. it, it's become a love. Once you start looking at them, you realize they're not out there to do you any harm. They just want to go about their business. And if you start to watch what they're doing, it's pretty interesting. It really is. Like, yeah, where, I mean, I know as a kid, I was raised to be terrified of spiders and bees and all creepy crawly things. And it's just kind of an innate fear. But yeah. in listening to this, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. I kind of want to, you know, start a hive. I mean, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do like my herb garden. Oh. So actually, I have a question for you. So right now I'm renting. I would love to buy a house eventually. Can you... But, but I don't want to start a hive and then have to move it. Do you do you typically leave hives where they are? They can do they be moved. move? Yeah. yeah, absolutely they can be moved. Um, once they're once they're big and strong, it's a little bit more of an operation. But um, you know, it's a little easier. Maybe you move it in the in the fall or the even the winter time hmm. um, or early spring. I guess I probably it's harder to move them when they're. Active in the middle of you know this belt. active season right now yeah. depends on how many how many hi how many bees are in the hive how strong it is that makes sense yeah. all right so so i could do it you absolutely <laughs> could do it yeah and i shouldn't worry about yeah. it too much that's so cool in the suburbs we like to uh we like to advise people to check with their neighbors and make sure that the neighbors are okay with it because, sure. you know, you can't keep them in your yard. They're going to fly wherever they fly. Yeah. If your neighbor's pretty anxious about it or somebody right close by is allergic, you might want to, you know, double think it. But, um, you know, generally sense. people are pretty tolerant. I've got great neighbors, fortunately. Oh, that's good. And if you offer them a little bit of honey, it goes ah. a long way. <laughs> good plan. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. There's some... Um, are there still some, I know that for a while they, that we were very concerned about, you know, hot, that hive collapse disease. Are, are there challenges facing our bees right now? Or because of people have been raising them more and being more careful, are the bee population starting to come back? Like, where are we in that? With colony, I, I think people aren't talking as much about colony collapse disorder as a, um, you know, as a, a thing in itself. But there are so many threats okay. to are honeybees and to the insect populations in general. Um, honeybees are subjected to a lot of diseases. There are quite a few viruses that have made their way um, around the circuit, around the world. Um, you know, people are traveling so much now, there's a lot of invasive species, um, and the same is true with microorganisms. So unfortunately, a lot of the viruses that have developed in other countries that attack honeybee hives have made their way to the United States. Um, there is a scourge of honeybee hives called varroa mites, which are very much like ticks. Um, they're tiny, tiny, tiny little things. But, you know, if you can imagine a tick on a honeybee, um, that's what they look like. They're, or they're kind of flea-sized, I guess. They're, they're a little Ugh. bit smaller than a flea. Um, and they attach themselves to the honeybees, and where they bite, they, you know, they can transmit viruses, just like ticks transmit viruses to humans. None of these would bother humans. The things that attack honeybees are not something we need to worry about as humans, but they will bring down a honeybee hive. Um, you know, they weaken the bees, and they, they like to attach themselves to the larvae inside, you know, when you 
when you have a, bees go through the same cycle that butterflies do. First it's an egg, then it's a larva, which is your caterpillar, and then they spin a, a cocoon, and that's the pupil stage, and then they hatch and they've got their wings. And honeybees go through the same thing. They have a larva, they're a little, you know, more like a worm looking thing. Um, and then the larva will spin itself a case. In, this is all going on inside the, the hive, um, and it becomes a pupa, and then it hatches out into a honeybee. Well, when they spin that pupil case, the varroa mite will be inside with them, eating, you know, Aww. sucking on the bee. And so if you can imagine, then your poor sad. little bees are just Aww. sick from the day they're born. It's really a horrible thing to see. So that's one of the things we teach in bee school is how to identify what's going on in a hive. And there are some methods to fight them. Nobody's been completely successful in, you know, getting rid of all the mites. All the honeybee hives always have mites these days. They came to the United States. The mites made it in in about 1988. So anybody that kept bees before that year didn't have to worry about it. Their bees were usually very healthy, and you know there were no real diseases, that, a couple of diseases, but nothing like what we've got now. So we spend a lot of time teaching new beekeepers how, how to know what's going on in their hives and what to do about it. And, you know, the other thing that's a big threat to honeybees and to all insects is the, the pesticides that people use in their yards, especially in the suburbs. It's, it's kind of a thing. You know, you want to you wanna kill the bugs that are eating your plants. It's hard to kill one bug and not another. So um, any pesticide that's out there is going to actually be an endangering not just the bug that you're targeting, but pretty much every other insect in your yard. So um, what if people ask me, you know, what is the what is the most important thing I could do to help honeybees? It's to stop using pesticides. Mm. And you'll end up with other insect life as well, but then you'll end up with things that like to eat the insects in your yard, and you get a whole ecosystem it's going like it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember as a child, my mother raised roses, and she was the whole little pesticide. And I remember spending hours just pulling Japanese beetles yep. off of it. That's me. <laughs> I know it's not really that much fun. <laughs> and no, aphids and <laughs> yeah, my cucumber leaves. <laughs> but I guess it's true. You know, you introduce another chemical and you don't really realize yeah. how it affects everything else around. And you know, some of the chemicals that people have access to now are systemic, meaning that you put it out there and it goes into the environment into the tissues of the plants and it's there for years. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time for it to dissipate. So it's there killing whatever is coming up to the plant. And this is one of the things that's especially dangerous for honeybees. If they come to feed on a flower that has one of these systemic pesticides in it, the very nectar that they're pulling from that flower is toxic. Mm -hmm. They bring it back to the hive. And this has been, um, there have been a lot of people doing research. I'm not 100% sure what the very latest thinking on this is, but there have been a lot of people that are that are doing research whether or not this is linked to colony collapse disorder, mm -hmm. that something that the bees are bringing back to the hives might actually be killing the, the colonies. So um, the, the class of chemicals that um, I'm thinking of when I'm when I'm talking about this is neonicotinoids, if you've ever heard that yeah. that term. Um, and they're, they're pretty useful. They're widely used in agriculture, and there's a great debate over whether or not we should, you know, if we ask people to stop using them in agriculture, um, you know, then the farmers have to come up with some other method that's, that's going to allow them to grow their crops without having them destroyed. Um, so there's an effort afoot in Massachusetts um, to reduce and restrict the use of neonicotinoids by homeowners. And I believe there's some new legislation that has been passed or some new regulations has been passed. Um, so it's a little harder to get, for instance, Grubex okay. for your yard. Grubex is a neonicotinoid. Um, and, you know, you can still get it if, you are, if you're a farmer. I don't know about Grubex, but one of the related chemicals. Um, farmers still have access to what they need, but we're trying to get people who are homeowners to, to use alternative methods, hmm. which would be huge for the honeybees. It really mm -hmm. would. Well, I can imagine keeping a hive... Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot you can do if your neighbors up to five miles away are using Exactly, things, yeah. So. so what we try to do is just get the word out. Yeah. You know? And fortunately, there's, just, there's been a lot in the press, and people are a lot more aware now. People are a lot more willing to try different things. Yeah, I 
think so. Which is a great trend. Yes, for sure. Well, I mean, when you hear uh, alarming news such as bee populations are dying out and soon we're not going to have any food, yeah. <laughs> I think people are like, okay, what can we do to fix yeah, this? Yeah, exactly. There's no bees, no food. No bees, no food for us. And guess what? No insects, no food for birds mm -hmm. and, you know, all the other creatures that eat insects. So it's a, you know, it's a whole web, mm -hmm. a whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So protect our ecosystem. Yeah. Raise some bees. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us, Kathy, in, in terms of bees? Um, anything we might I would say this? don't be afraid of them. They're really, you know, especially when they're on the flowers, just enjoy watching what yeah. they're doing. They're not going to bother you. You can just, you know, leave them alone and let them do their thing. And, um, you know, if anybody is interested in learning beekeeping, as I highly recommend the WCBA, Worcester County Beekeepers Association. And so please, they have a, they have a website. They have a wonderful, friendly group that will welcome you. All you got to do is show up to one of the meetings, introduce yourself, and I guarantee you will be welcome. Beekeepers are very friendly folk, and they love to make friends, and they love to talk about bees and tell, <laughs> as you can tell, they love to talk about bees, and they love to welcome new people into the fold. That's wonderful. All right, and we'll definitely have that information on our website on our with website. the link directly to the site for the Worcester County Beekeepers Association. Cool. Well, thank you for coming by. Yeah, today. thank You're you. You're very welcome. Uh, it was my pleasure. News about bees. Thank you. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> and this is anything that we need to talk about coming up at the library in May. Do we have anything exciting? We're all getting ready for our summer reading, folks. So stay tuned for what's going to happen this summer. Ah, oh, yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, and if you have any questions for us or you want to um, suggest or throw your name into the ring to be interviewed on our podcast, feel free to send us an email at podcasts at northboroughlibrary.org. And we'd always love to see you. We've got books on beekeeping. We've got videos on beekeeping. We've got all kinds of information for you. Uh, so feel free to stop by and say hello. We'd love to chat with you. Um, or give us a call, 508-393-5025. Thanks again for listening. This is Deborah. And I'm Katrina. And this is Dot Talks News and Views.